Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. Some people know it as P-O-A-A-S. I'm actually surprised how many people know it that way, and I'm impressed. Well, that is the way I shorten it on the YouTube videos, at least. But in other platforms and audio platforms, it will come as the Philosophy of Art and Science, and sometimes the ampersand, sometimes a simple and. Anyway, enough of that. If you want to support these programs, head over to patreon.com slash tohado. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash T-E-W-A-H-I-D-O. You can also join the YouTube channel directly and add super chats whenever we go live. Those are various ways you can support. And for those unallergic to reading, they can sign up to aksum.substack.com, A-K-S-U-M dot substack.com. That's enough plugging. My guest today is Saadit or Saadit Amirat. How are you doing today? Awesome. How are you, Henok? Spring is I'm doing well. Air, so I'm pretty excited. Well, I don't like spring in the air because I have a lot of pollen allergies. Uh, yeah. But uh, Daina, you said bag uh, Let me say to to begin our little talk on 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 guz. So we mentioned last time. I mean, we focused on politics last time we spoke. I think it was around September or something. We recorded and we released it right before the November. 2020 election for some of the ballot propositions, but this time we wanted to get a little bit more into our lovely religion, uh, the is right version of the Orthodox Church. And I think you mentioned a little bit last time, but maybe to make this more standalone, could you could you tell us to um, you know to what extent did you grow up going to church in you know in Addis Ababa and in LA and other cities perhaps that you've lived in? And, you know, how much would you say involvement you had with, with goods? Because anyone at least has some sort of passive involvement by, by being a member of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Yeah, sure. I think uh, when uh, I was an Addis until at the age of 12, we, ironically, we didn't regularly attend as, uh, attended church as much as we, as much as I started to right after we moved to the States. Um, I would say the one event that we consistently went to church for was uh, Filseta, the 15 days. You know, schools were closed at the, you know, during that season in Ethiopia, and every kid goes to church during that, you know, those 15 days. But outside of that, my parents regularly went, but somehow they would let us sleep in on Sundays. Mm -hmm. But right after we moved to the States, like, you know, we came to Los Angeles, um, the churches are much more tighter, you know, as far as like tight knit community. And we kind of got into a routine of going every Sunday. So every Sunday, my mom would wake me up at 4 a.m. And so I think I started that routine after I moved to the States, ironically. Um, but that said, I, I would say my involvement with Giz, um, I mean, I think growing up, we all learn, like, you know, we all learn Amharic, and uh, Amharic, the language uses is letters and so that's kind of like one part of the equation right we're able to read it well reading reading it means two things right like there's the proper way of reading it but just like just literally reading the letters uh someone who can speak Amharic and who can read Amharic has the advantage of being able to read is in that sense as well and so I would say that was the extent to which I was you know associated with the language but Outside of that, yes, I, you know, attended masses. I rarely understood what they were talking about. I mean, to this day, I still am um, a student of Giz, and I still have to work on understanding the, gram the grammar and the meaning behind the words. Um, but yeah, so I think that's kind of like a quick summary of my exposure and my early Yeah, that, that's good. So when you were in Addis Ababa, um, I think hindsight is twenty twenty, and and sometimes we look back at these past events and sometimes we read into it maybe more than than we did. But I'm I'm curious at the time, did they tell you this is the Giz alphabet and this is the Amharic language and they, did they distinguish it for you that way? Or do you recall like when did you kind of first realize that mm -hmm. Giz was a thing? Because I meet a lot of people who happen to know a lot of Giz words, mm -hmm. who happen to be using the Giz alphabet, but who don't necessarily know those things, you know, right. at, at a in a critically thinking way. It's just they've sort of passively received it and they assume it's all just Amarinya or Tigrinya for that right. matter. Well, that much I could say, We, I like I can speak for myself. Uh, this may not be true to my other Addis dwellers at the time. And that's actually news to me. 
I thought it was a given that everybody would know the difference between Be'ez and, um, and Amharic. And, um, but kind of going back to when I learned the difference between the two, I can't think of it. It's one of those things I've known all my life type situation. I knew that similarly to Latin, the church used it. And by virtue of not being able to understand what they were talking about, I knew it was not Amharic. Because, you know, I'm a native Amharic speaker and I'm able to understand even at, at a, such a young age, like I think, I mean, I don't have any issues. Like like any kid who grew up in Addis, we didn't have any problem just understanding the language. So if you understand Amharic, you go to church and you hear a different language like this, then you can clearly discern, right? Like the difference between the two. But maybe it is less so for those who speak native Tigrinya because it's even closer to Giz. So maybe, I don't know if your experiences are with those who are native Tigrinya speakers who have a hard time kind of seeing, knowing the difference between the two, but at least speaking for myself and what I think is most of my friends who grew up in Addis, I think most of us can tell the difference between Amarinya and Giz. I would say that most of my interactions where people can't tell the difference, they're diasporic Ethiopians. And so that's different. Mm -hmm. But even I would say amongst native speakers, you know, for example, someone can say to say human rights, someone mm -hmm. could say human rights with an mm -hmm. accent. And I think most Shagar people would say that, but I would mm -hmm. say the higher culture, the higher literate people would say mm -hmm. and the word Sabawi, they would say it, and I think they would just assume it's Amharic without realizing, for example, that that is a good word. Oh, um, I see what you mean. I think so. I, so I think to further elaborate on that, there are a lot of shared words in both Giz that Amharic has adapted from Giz, right? So I definitely hear you on the gray area. Uh, I think if somebody was to bust into a Giz sentence, I think anyone who speaks <laughs> of Amharic can understand that they're speaking a different language. But when you're kind of like uh, you know, looking at like these individual phrases or words that also have commonality in Giz, then it becomes harder to tell apart. Because then I would fall in that category as well, right? Because there are many words in Giz that we use in Amharic as well without understanding that. Uh, because we don't understand Giz, we don't know that uh, that vocabulary is also the same one in Giz, right? And yeah, so, my, my aunt, um, rest in peace, has been a few years since she passed, but she would say she doesn't speak a lick of Giz, and she would randomly say things like Abbasku Gabarku, which is, I think, more properly Abbasa Gabarku, which is, I, I've done a trespass, I've done an iniquity, I've sinned. Yeah. And she would just say that, and I would look at her like, I was like, you know, that's just like pure Giz, like, mm -hmm. there's no Amharic in that. And um, so it's I think- It's funny you mentioned that, because my mom, I grew up hearing my mom say the whole, like, my whole childhood and I didn't even understood what she was talking about and so that's a prime example of somebody who kind of grew up around Giz that may not have recognized it was indeed Giz right so that's right that's right and I remember I think you were inspired by one of the videos on on this channel and I don't know how much long after that but it's something you've been thinking about for years in general mm -hmm. you began saying you know what it's not just for I don't need to be a sage in the church or a master of the Giz language, but I am going to begin, you know, the way people take a Python course or a, you know, UX design course or whatever it may be, I'm, I'm going to start doing what I can using the resources and the communities and the people, the, the elders, the kind of a community knowledge base that already exists in my networks mm -hmm. to try to work on, on my goods. So can you tell the audience how, how you began, you know, searching for, and, and how did you stumble upon a, a goods course and, and yeah, begin yeah. to, you know, learn? For sure. I think, um, well, I think luckily at a young age, I was um, aware of, um, you know, intellectuals who studied Semitic languages, right? Um, including, you know, Southern Semitic languages like Giz and Arabic and Sabaic and Northern Semitic languages like Hebrew and Akkadian and Assyrian. And maybe I'm kind of now, um, you know, <laughs> butchering some of the, like the way that the different regions are separated, but, um, at a young age, like, you know, I was very much very uh, interested in history. I 
uh, was fascinated with learning near extinct languages to understand mysteries of the past. Um, and so, you know, just by virtue of kind of having those interests, I was always very fascinated with the Giz. And actually in college, I may have mentioned it to you, I almost kind of created my own independent study. And my uh, professor who was um, allowing me to kind of study under him, specialized in Southern Semitic languages. And they were kind of like cooking up, uh, you know, curriculum for me that would allow me to specialize in Giz. So I'm giving that context to just kind of, um, set a clear that I was never uh, prevented from learning it, thinking it was only reserved to the Likaons, like church Likaons, right? But I think what uh, one of the videos inspired me this recently was um, a path that I never took, like Kwan took the path I never took, right? Because I almost did that um, independent study that would have eventually led me to a PhD program then that would have allowed me to do all things semantics and is and be a historian. But for various reasons, you know, um, and th that this is a topic for another day because I think I switched my major like five times in college. Uh, uh, no regrets. Uh, I would ha I would say no regrets. I think everything happened for a reason, but somehow I did not uh, end up pursuing that path. And there was a long period of time when I was not sure how I would um, have the opportunity to learn this, right? Because in my mind, um, you either kind of learn it at a university setting or be back home in Ethiopia at a, a Binet school or something. So for uh, the options were very limited, right? And so, um, and so now I think there are opportunities created online, um, so many resources on the internet for those who want to learn by themselves or uh, on their own, like you did uh, starting a few years back. I mean, Unlike you, I don't have the kind of discipline needed to, because I've always had the interest, but not the discipline to really go after it, which kind of makes me wonder sometimes if at a young age I was into all of those things out of infatuation, right? Like, because it sounded so glamorous and cool. But either way, like, I did not kind of, I, I did not possess the kind of discipline that allowed me to really hunker down and learn it on my own. But as of recently, because of COVID, COVID has been a blessing in disguise folks that have been doing it in person realize they could transfer those resources online and so having the opportunity to have an organized you know classroom setting online where we're being followed and given live feedback from a um, you know from an expert has been kind of the kind of uh platform that i needed to really finally dive right deep into it right and so and here we are now that that's wonderful yeah that's right it's a blessing in disguise for those who know how to use it. You know, mm -hmm. I, I saw some report that said, I think the average weight gain during the, <laughs> the plague here is about 20 pounds. And amongst the millennials, it's like 40. I'm in the middle there. I gained like 30 and I'm just working on, on getting that back down. And so some people, you know, react by not working out as much. Some people, you know, they cope. I mean, and it's, and it's a legitimate, people have legitimate coping mechanisms, but some people become stronger through the adjustments, the adaptations that are being made during this time. And I see you working on, on your intellectual game and, and your ancient tongue game mm -hmm. um, during this time. So what is the kind of methodology of the learning? Because Giz has, as you've said, so many different aspects. Back mm -hmm. home in Ethiopia, the people begin with a nibab bit. I mean, Fidel, you already know, which are the letters. And they begin with nibab bit, which I've simulated, but using Amharic in my channel, where you go to, you know, First John, the epistle of First John, chapter one, then the gospel of John, chapter one, and then primarily the Psalms of David, which are 150. And in the university setting, they kind of bring out these dusty grammar books that they want you to do. And uh, I've had some people say that those are kind of difficult and they're made for people who know no Amharic, but they just know English. So what what has been the kind of methodology that you've been using to, to learn Ge'ez thus far? Sure. So um, I joined the Makana Tababat Qudus Yared Ge'ez Timirtuit last fall around, I would say, October, September. I think we started at the same time. Um, and right around the same time, one of the clergy members at our church, you know, started offering um, <clears throat> one session a week every Wednesday. 
And so to kind of go through the sequencing of lessons that you wanted to, me to elaborate, um, yeah, I, so the fact that, I, I mean, I am with the adults and most of us, well, all of us were born back home. So we had the opportunity to learn the feed in. So we're kind of on the same stage, you know, um, stage on that. Uh, and then we're now focusing on the niba, right? So, you know. The reading out loud in case anyone Reading out know. loud, correct. Um, so Fidel is the letters, kind of like learning the A, B, C, D. So most of us who speak Amharic already know um, how to, you know, already know the alphabet. Um, and then... Some exceptions. Some of the Dikala or Tirfa Fidel people trip up on. Okay. Which ones are those? Like, you mean the... For example, Kwa, Gwa, Oh, yeah. Yes. I think... Self, I think you know we, we and Queenat, the Queen and Queenat, mm -hmm. I think is Queenat. Correct. Um, yes, maybe not comprehensive knowledge of all the letters that we should know, because in a way, Amharic is kind of like a watered down version of Giz, right? And a lot of things are lost. So, but given that, like just the basic fundamentals, most Amharic speakers can at least survive and just read. But that said, um, reading in Giz has a whole different meaning, right? Um, like the way inflection points, the way your voice is supposed to go up and down, and um, and maybe there is a better way of saying those things. Hey, no, let me know. Like, say, yeah, there, there are, yeah, there are, there are rules. The way our professor told us mm -hmm. is, you know, there are two main kind of directions, which is up and down. But then within the up, there's a straight up and there's a diagonal up. Within the down, there's a straight down and a diagonal down. And so there are rules based off of what the, you know, the, the last letter is and whether it's a verb or not and, and several sort of rules of grammar that learn that you learn to remember that. But then when you come to names, there are no rules. You just have to memorize when it's a name, for example, um, Mikael goes downward and Gabriel goes up and there's no rule behind that and you can't, you know, uh, if anything, maybe Mikael should go up because he's the higher archangel, but there's no rule like that. It just, you just memorize those. So some things are just agreed upon standards and some are logical rules that you apply. Correct. And um, it's actually as part of like the pedagogy, we were lucky in that our teacher has figured out kind of like a formula to communicate to us. But if most who learn uh, Nibab usually just learn it through pure reciting. And over time, they start to really recognize patterns and then memorize through memorization. And because Abinet School is composed of, you know, learning huge bodies of text from the 150 Psalms to the Wudase Mariams to so many other spiritual books written, uh, you know, amongst the rich resources that we have within the Orthodox Church. I think once you get through memorizing and like learning how to recite all of them, by then you have an understanding of the patterns of how, which ones go up and down. But because we're kind of late in the game, like when I say we, I'm talking about me and my uh, classmates in the adults guys class, our teacher follows a slightly separate pedagogy where he initially started with uh, teaching us, um, ways to recognize the patterns without having to go through just the sheer memorization, kind of like a shortcut, if you will. Um, so yeah, I guess to go, get back into it. So yeah, now we're focusing on Nibab, just how to read. And I can give a sample, Henok and I agreed, perhaps Psalm 1 might be the most appropriate for this occasion. Um, and then I think next our teacher has um, hopes of uh, getting deeper into the language as far as like even learning gra like grammar and meanings behind the words so that we can actually start communicating in this and other purposes like translating books because there are so many books that are in this that have not been translated to Amharic. Um, so that's a solid point. So before you read it, so for those to understand, this is where the Ethiopian system of traditional schooling, I think is grueling to some people. I know you and I have had different moments of, of giggling throughout the learning process because, you know, it's, it's tough and especially it's tougher when you're older and there's a, you know, there's a high rate of people quitting and attrition mm -hmm. um, because it's, you know, it's, it's very difficult in that way. 
and it weeds a lot of people out. But one of the the interesting things that you just mentioned is you've been doing this since last fall, something like six months or more. And throughout all this time, you're not really learning the meaning of words. Mm -hmm. Occasionally and on the side, you're picking up the meaning, but it's mm -hmm. not the main focus. The primary focus is purely the correct pronunciation and getting acclimated to the environment of the 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 various books of the of the literature of the, the canon mm -hmm. we're we're going through. So Again, we're not going to assume as she reads this that she's the master of every word that she reads aloud. But thankfully, we have Amharic and English translations we can consult and, you know, outside of the class to to try to match the words and, and figure it out by the context. And and slowly but surely, like you said, the meaning and the kane, which leads to then even poetry and translation and research. So, you know, you, you might be able to do the research that you wanted just outside of the institution, outside of exactly. academia. And, exactly. And that's what people yeah. are, are exactly. doing a lot more these days. And which is so amazing because um, there are different ways of, uh, you know, uh, fulfilling your goals, right? Perhaps it's, it didn't come in the way that I thought it was going to be when in my late teens, you know, when I was exploring college majors. But it's been such a pleasant surprise that I'm able to have this opportunity, right? And so, um, I mean, and this kind of applies to any goal that you, somebody might have in life. There are, there's more than one way of, you know, circling back to whatever interests that you have, you know, and you're never too old to pick up learning anything. So, okay. So uh, now that we have that, we've given that preface, should we dive right into it? Please, please okay. read it for them. Uh, all right. Well, this is Psalm 1 in Giz. Yes, Salmon and Giz. Okay. Mazmur Ahadu Fekare Zatkan was a hat an Mazmur Zadawit Halleluya Bisub Si Zaihora Bamakarasi an was a Ikoma with Safinot hat an was a Navara with Saman Vara Mr. Salik an Zada Amu Hugazavir Simratu was a Hugoyanab Malta Walelita. Waikawan Kama is and Tatakil Taba Muhazamai and Tatuhu Freha Babagiziha Wakwas Lani Yitnagaf Wakulo Zagavra Yfaisam Ako Kamazi Hat Anisa Ako Kamazi Daimu Kamamare Zaghufu Nafas and Gas Amid Waba and Tazi Yitnasu Rasian and Dain Wai Hat An Ustamakras Adkan Amen. And that tataf is said, since we're in the Paschal season, I have mm -hmm. to touch on it. It's said on our Good Friday, on our Siklet or Sigdet, our crucifixion or our day of prostration and bowing down. And there is the fire representing the devil, representing the dragon, representing Satan. And we stamp it out with our makwamia, with our staves, and we yell that tataf. So even in the church now, you can participate by reading the psalm on, on Siklet, maybe. We'll see. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that would be amazing. I'm too tired from all the prostrations by that point. In the <laughs> um, well, this is great. Do, do you have any parting words of encouragement for any of the women out there, any of the young girls, or for that matter, anyone listening who for whatever reason has this kind of thought or desire of beginning to learn, but maybe is intimidated somehow. Do you, do you have anything uh, to encourage them to, to begin in whatever fashion Absolutely. they can? Absolutely. I think um, two saints that I love to reference Anytime somebody's intimidated to start an endeavor, like learning is, is Kaddus uh, Yared and Kaddus Georgi Zaghasitcha. So both of them, you know, are examples of people who may not have started with natural abilities immediately, but all it took was, you know, a, a, a good intentions to sincerely give it a good faith effort and um you know willing to work hard for it and god rewarded both of them with uh the opportunity to you know be authors of some of the most important works of religious literature that we have 
and Yaren, including all the hymenals, worship materials that we have that sets us apart from other Orthodox churches. And so both of them started with, you know, uh, being kind of like the, the last ones in their class that were made fun of that teachers would give up on. Um, and but both of them would refuse to give up. And actually, one thing that they both have in common that I absolutely love that that I also like find very endearing is Kedus uh, Urayel was actually sent to both of them, kind of like Saint Ezra, to uh, you know to partake, uh, you know to um, you know yeah yeah yes yet of like you know to impart wisdom upon them from God, um, and so. And Israel is the angel, <laughs> one of the angels of God, um, and um, so all that to say, you know, you know, if you have a true desire um, and good intentions, willing to work hard for it, and even if you may not even have that much time, and you're uh, you're trying to pick up a hobby, or you're not, maybe you may not want to be an expert in it, but just want to have an understanding of the language a little bit. Uh, to connect to your heritage. I say there are resources now, like the school that I'm a part of online. Uh, but in addition to that, like eat the book, the website has a recording of all the materials, along with a plethora of other, I'm sure, websites that I'm not familiar with. And so, um, you know, if you have the interest, don't let any other factor intimidate you from learning about it. And I have some of the students in my class. So the school that I talked about, Kadusiari uh, Makana I see the age range is probably be, be, between four as the youngest, and then maybe people in their fifties. So that's a wide range right there. So if you fall within that spectrum, or even beyond that, right, um, there is uh, something for everyone. That's right for all ages. Ayakutaki, <laughs> thank you so much, Salit. You're welcome, Hanok. Thank you for having me.